Hey there, I'm Matt. Thanks for checking out this video. We are continuing a series called A Course Correction because there are times in our lives when we all start to drift. Maybe you've found yourself far from where you thought you'd be, especially in your relationship with God. Well, I definitely wanna say that you're not alone. We all sometimes lose focus on what's most important and rely less on God and more on ourselves. But what happens when we get to those places and how can we start to get back on track with where God wants us to be? Today, we're diving into a powerful story from ancient Israel's history about a guy named Ezra. And from this story, we'll get some pretty amazing insights for us today that can help us see where we can start to course script. Let's get started. The Bible is the story of God's interaction with mankind from the very beginning of history. It tells us that God created a perfect world with perfect people, but it gives them free will. And when mankind chooses to turn they're back on the source of all that's good. We brought all that was bad. And so the first period of time that the Bible tells us about is in those succeeding generations after Adam and Eve where every generation became more and more corrupt until God said, I'm gonna restart all of human history with Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. And he does, but it only takes three generations until the same thing is happening again. So God comes to Abraham, and this is where the story goes from all the people of the world to one specific people in a specific part of the world. And he says to Abram, he says, listen, if you will trust me, no matter what I say, to go no matter where I say, and to do no matter what I say, then through you, the rest of the world will be able to be reconciled back to me. You guys are going to become, and all of your descendants, an example of what it looks like to make atonement for your sins, the things that separate you from me, and how to live in a relationship with me. So Abraham, the Bible says, believes God, and because of that, it was accounted to him as righteous. And then he moves at God's direction from ancient Mesopotamia to Canaan, modern-day Israel, on the far eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea. And that was the land that God gave Abraham and all of his descendants. So God promises to Abraham, his son Isaac, his grandson Jacob, that through you, eventually, there'll be one specific descendant who will atone for the sins of all mankind and would be a light to the Gentiles. Jacob said that he would be the one whom all nations worship. We know that that ends up becoming Jesus, but they don't know that at the time. They just know there's going to be a descendant someday who will reconcile all and any people back to God, their creator. Well, Jacob has 12 sons. And they're the founders of the 12 tribes of Israel. And they're not all good guys. They sell one of the brothers it is slavery in Egypt, and through a series of really cool circumstances, he becomes prime minister of Egypt. There's a famine in Canaan. The brother in Egypt gets everybody to voluntarily move to Egypt, and over the next 400 years, they become slaves. They cry out for deliverer. God sends them Moses, who takes them back to the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They settle there in their tribes. Each one of them have equal access to God. They, have, they appoint judges to rule over them civilly, but they say, we want to be like all the nations around us. And God says to them, I've never wanted you to be like the nations around it, right? And even now, the Bible says to come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. He says, don't touch the unclean thing. Like God's always wanted his people to be unique within mankind. And he tells them that too, but they insist and he gives it to them. So they go through a period of 450 years where they have a succession of one disastrous king after another. There's only three kings that rule all of Israel together, and then there's a civil war, and the rest of the kings in the Bible are actually over two divided kingdoms. You've got the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom is obliterated by the Assyrians. The Babylonians conquer them, and then they take over all of all of Israel. The last good king we talked about two weeks ago, uh, his name is Josiah. God had told him, you're a great guy. You've done everything I've ever wanted you to do. You're, you're, you're a man like, like your father, David. But I'm still going to wipe out Jerusalem and the temple. Because one of his ancestors was a guy named Manasseh, who had offered his son, he burned his son alive to a demon god and had constructed idols to these demon gods in Solomon's temple. God said, the whole place, all of Jerusalem and the temple is defiled. I'm going to destroy it. I will not be worshipped there anymore. And it's only four years after Josiah dies that Nebuchadnezzar lays siege to Jerusalem. Kidnaps Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and a bunch of other people, and takes them back to Babylon. There's two more sieges, but the whole point is that within 23 years after Josiah has died, all of Israel has ceased to exist. 
There's no more northern kingdom. There's no more southern kingdom. All of Jerusalem is destroyed, and the temple of Solomon is in ruins. Daniel rises to prominence. We learned about him last week. Daniel asked God, how long will we be separated from the land of our fathers? And God says, 70 years. Daniel is wise. He gives the interpretation of dreams. He gives good counsel. So he's the number one man under Nebuchadnezzar and then his successor, Belshazzar. And then the Syrians take over with Cyrus the Great and he recognizes the value of keeping a man like Daniel around and he does. And that's where we pick up the biblical narrative today in Ezra chapter one. So if you've got your Bible, go to Ezra chapter one and I'll start reading in verse one. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy that he had given through Jeremiah in answer to Daniel's question, how long will you keep us away from Jerusalem? 70 years. So God keeps his promise through Jeremiah and he stirred the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. Now here's what's cool. We actually have a copy of this writing and it's called the Cyrus Cylinder. You can Google it and it actually talks about what we're reading about right now. Verse two, this is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he's appointed uh, me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judea. Any of you who are his people may go to Jerusalem and Judea, Judah, sorry, to rebuild this temple of the Lord, the God of Israel who lives in Jerusalem, and may your God be with you. Wherever this Jewish remnant is found, let their neighbors contribute toward their expenses by giving them silver and gold, supplies for the journey, and livestock, as well as a voluntary offering to the temple of God in Jerusalem. Then God stirred the hearts of the priests and Levites and the leaders of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of the Lord. And all of their neighbors assisted by giving them articles of silver and gold, supplies for the journey, and livestock. They gave them many valuable gifts in addition to all of the voluntary offerings. King Cyrus himself brought out the articles that King Nebuchadnezzar in their previous empire had taken from the Lord's temple in Jerusalem when he destroyed it and had placed on the temple of his own gods. Now, if this sounds familiar to you, this has happened once before. When the children of Israel were exiled out of the land of Canaan in Egypt, and Moses told them that God was going to deliver them, he told them, go to all of your Egyptian neighbors and ask them for their silver and gold and see what happens. And God said that he moved in their hearts and they gave them all of their gold and silver. So the Jews plundered the Egyptians when they left and went back to Canaan. Now they've been exiled farther east in the land of Persia, at Babylon, and God tells them through Cyrus, the leader of the Persians, to go ask all of your neighbors for gold and silver. And God softened the heart of all the neighbors and they gave them all of their gold and silver. So this is the second time in the story of the Bible that the Jewish people have been sent back to Israel from exile with their pockets full of money, uh, which is pretty cool. So they get back there. Ezra chapter three is where we pick up the story next. In the early autumn, they'd spend all summer rebuilding their homes in the land of their forefathers. The Israelites settled in their towns and all the people assembled back in Jerusalem for a unified purpose. So they no longer saw themselves as Southern Kingdom and Northern Kingdom. Now they just saw themselves as the people of God. They learned their lesson in exile. Uh, from then on, from then until the time of Jesus, which is about 480 years, they never go back to demon idol worship ever again. In fact, they become so strict about enforcing the rules on everybody that by the time Jesus shows up, there's a new class of Jewish leaders called Pharisees and Sadducees who say, you gotta check all of these boxes in order to be right with God. But God had even told all the way back to Abraham, he said, no, I just want you to trust me, right? But they had learned their lesson in exile, they're unified. They know they're not supposed to be like the nations around them. They come back to Jerusalem, and here's what they do in verse 2. Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, joined his fellow priest, and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtel, with his family, and rebuilding the altar of God of the God of Israel, because they wanted to sacrifice the burnt offerings on as instructed in the law of Moses, the man of God. So the very first thing that's actually rebuilt in Jerusalem is the altar on which they would atone for their sins over the last many decades, many generations. And then it says at the end of verse three, then they began to sacrifice burnt offerings on the altar to the Lord every morning and evening as they were instructed to do. And here's what I love, is that the two guys that Cyrus approves to be in charge 
of the rebuilding or the reconstruction of the temple is a guy named Zerubbabel and a guy named Joshua. Actually, he gives us the guy named Joshua first and then Zerubbabel. So these guys, I don't know, how old are they, 20, 30, 40? We don't know how old they are, but they were born sometime because it's the first year of Cyrus's reign and he's the new Persian Empire, uh, em, uh, ruler of the Persian Empire. These guys were born under King Nebuchadnezzar and their parents, separate, not in the same family, one set of parents named their sons Zerubbabel, which means we are scattered in Babylon. Zeru or Zerub means scattered. Babel is Babylon. We're scattered in Babylon. And Joshua's parents named him God Saves. So you've got two separate families who named their sons two separate things. Empires change from Babylonians to the Persians and a new king, a new ruler, a new emperor, Cyrus the Great, randomly picks two Jewish guys to be in charge of the construction and I don't think he even knew what their names meant because their names together mean God is saving those who are scattered in Babylon. Like, I, I've got no point to make from that. I just think it's incredibly cool. The next thing that happens is that they begin to build the foundation of the temple. So the first thing they build is the altar. They sacrifice morning and evening, just like the Torah says that they should do. Then they build the foundation of the temple. And that takes, I believe, two years to do that. Now, here's what's really cool. We know Jesus grew up visiting the temple. The temple that Jesus built isn't Solomon's temple because that was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. The temple that Jesus visited is the one that we're reading about being built right now. And that one was built on the foundation stones that Zerubbabel and Joshua, God is saving those who are scattered in Babylon, uh, had laid. Now, the Romans, years later, 70 AD, destroyed the second temple, the one that's being built right now. And to this day, the temple's never been rebuilt. But to this day, you can go to Jerusalem and go to the Wailing Wall, where everybody's praying, they're bowing, you might have seen pictures. Then they write their little prayers on a piece of paper and they stick it in the cracks in the wall. That wall is the foundation stones that later the temple was built on that Jesus worshiped in. And so today you can actually go and touch the foundation stones that we're reading about right now today in the book of Ezra. So they lay the foundation, they start to build the temple and then Cyrus the Great dies. There's two other kings in between him and Darius who don't last very long, but those guys are not as favorable to the Jewish people as Cyrus or as Darius. So the enemies of the children of Israel write back to those two kings and say, you should really stop them. I think they're gonna rise up against you and stop giving you tribute. So they tell the children of Israel to stop building, and they do. So the Bible says that construction on the temple stops for the next two kings of Persia and doesn't start up again until the second year of the reign of Darius. And here's why it starts up. It starts up because two guys named Haggai and Zechariah, and you might recognize their names because they wrote books in the Old Testament. Those guys live in Jerusalem, and they say, why aren't we working? And the temple construction people say, because the king of Persia told us to stop. And he said, are they more powerful or is God more powerful? Like, choose. Like, either we're going to do what God wants us to do or not, and all the people follow Haggai and Zechariah and Jeshua and Zerubbabel, pick up the cause again, and they rebuild the temple. While they're rebuilding the temple, they write a letter to Darius. Nebuchadnezzar, excuse me, Nebuchadnezzar had picked Daniel. Belshazzar kept Daniel. Cyrus kept Daniel. Darius keeps Daniel. Daniel dies under the reign of Darius. Darius gets this letter from the enemies of the Jewish people saying they're rebuilding. And, and the last king, the one who preceded you, said not to. And here's what's really cool. He actually, uh, he writes them back. Darius writes uh, the complainers about the rebuilders of the temple. This letter in Ezra chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. He says, do not disturb the construction of the temple of God. Let it be rebuilt on its original site and do not hinder the governor of Judah and the elders of the Jews and the work. Moreover, verse 8, I hereby decree that you are to help these elders of the Jews as they rebuild this temple of God. You must pay the full construction costs. 
without delay from my taxes collected in the province west of the Euphrates River so that the work will not be interrupted. And they finish construction of the temple that Jesus is one day going to be raised and he's named in where his mom and dad Joseph and his, excuse me, his stepdad Joseph and his mother Mary bring him. Uh, they give him the name Jesus and all the stories, Jesus flipping over the, the tables uh, in the temple, that's in this temple. That's Ezra chapter one through six. Now, the construction of the temple is Ezra one through six. Ezra shows up in the story in the back half of the book of Ezra. So it's many years later, the temple has already been built. There's been several other kings that have come up. Darius dies, his son Xerxes becomes king. Xerxes is married to a queen named Vashti who displeases him. He banishes her and then he marries a Jewish girl named Esther. Esther becomes queen of Persia She's married to Xerxes. Xerxes has a son named Artaxerxes from an unnamed woman. There's no evidence that Artaxerxes is the son of Esther, There's, but he's definitely the son of Xerxes. Xerxes, prime minister, he's the first one to get a prime minister that's not Jewish. His name is Haman, and he's a wicked man, and he ends up dying, and it's Esther, the Jewish queen's cousin, Mordecai, who becomes the new prime minister. So Artaxerxes, who becomes the king of Persia, is raised by his father, Xerxes, his stepmom, Esther, living under the authority of a Jewish prime minister named Mordecai, which explains why Artaxerxes was so friendly towards the Jewish cause. Ezra chapter seven, verse one. Many years later, during the reign of King Artaxerxes of Persia, there was a man named Ezra. He was a son of Sariah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah. And this guy is very friendly to the Jewish people. He actually commissions Ezra to go back with a second wave of immigrants to Jerusalem. And he writes a letter to Ezra commissioning him to do this, and you find that in Ezra chapter 7, verse 12. From Artaxerxes, the king of kings, to Ezra, the priest of God, who at that time was living in Babylon, the teacher of the law, of the God of heaven, greetings. I decree that any of the people of Israel in my kingdom, including the priests and Levites, may volunteer to return to Jerusalem with you. I, in my council of seven, hereby instruct you to conduct an inquiry into the situation in Judah and Jerusalem based on your God's law, which is in your hand. We also commission you to take with you silver and gold, which are freely, which we are freely presenting as an offering to the God of Israel who lives in Jerusalem. And the rest of Ezra is the story of him going back to Jerusalem and reestablishing the worship of God that remains consistent all the way until the Greeks conquer. Artaxerxes' great-great-grandson, Darius III, this worship of God stays consistent in the temple in Jerusalem, even through the conquest of the Romans over the Greeks, all the way until the time of Jesus. But a few things happen uh, in the last half of the book of Ezra that I wanted to point out. He discovers that none of the Levites wanted to go back with him because they were too comfortable now as Persians. So he drafts them and he makes them go back. And they do. He's also given, remember I told you, I just read how uh, King Artaxerxes gives him an offering to take back, to give to the God of Israel when they go back uh, to the temple in Jerusalem. He's given 48,000 pounds of silver, 7,500 pounds of silver utensils, 7,500 pounds of gold, and random other expensive metals. And there's this random detail that Ezra gives about himself. So he's got all of this fabulous wealth, 45,000 pounds of silver, 7,500 pounds of gold that he's got to transport from Babylon back to Jerusalem. And he says, 
I was ashamed to ask the king for bodyguards because I had already told him that God protects, uh, that, that God's hand of protection is on all who worship him. So because he had already said God's hand of protection is on all who worship him, I think he's given all this gold and now he's got to travel like two months worth of journey walking back to Jerusalem safely without getting robbed by bandits or marauders or thieves. And he's thinking, it's pretty dangerous. I should ask the king for guards. And he goes, I was too embarrassed to ask the king for guards because I already said that God's going to protect his people. So what he does is he calls all the people to pray and fast the days leading up to the trip. And they're only praying for one thing. Dear God, keep us safe. <laughs> That's all he prays. They all, all the people, they declare a fast and prayer uh, because he had said, God will protect us. He's wishing he had guards, but he'd already committed himself to it. Um, so he just puts himself, himself in, in the hands of God. He says, God, you got to protect us. And God does. Uh, and after all these years, when he goes back to Jerusalem, they've had the temple open now uh, for, I mean, through several kings, from Darius all the way to Artaxerxes. And, uh, so, oh, excuse me, through all of Xerxes' reign and Artaxerxes' reign. It's actually, I believe, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign that Ezra is sent back. So all these decades later, he goes back to Jerusalem and he finds out that the Jewish people are marrying all of the women of these pagan nations around them. And the problem with that is that they were raising their Jewish children to worship demon gods again. And then there's this whole chapter uh, toward the end of the book of Ezra where he sits down. The Bible says that he, he tore his robe, he pulled out some of his hair, and plucked some of his beard out in anguish and just begged God. He said, God, we're doing it again. We are doing it. Like we never, ever learn our lesson. And I've been at that place. You might have too. We've done the same stupid thing over and over and over again. And then you ask God to forgive you. And then you know he does. And then you go do it again. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? Well, that's, that's actually in the Bible. Like the children of Israel did this. And here's what's awesome. He says, we do not deserve to be forgiven. But I know because of your great love for us and your great mercy that you will. Which is phenomenal. So if you find yourself having fallen into the same stupid sin again and again and again, my encouragement for you is to read the prayer of Ezra at the end of his letter, of his, of his history book. Pray that prayer yourself. Dear God, right? I've done it again. And it ends, the book of Esther ends kind of rough. In Ezra chapter 10, verse 7, then a proclamation was made throughout Judah and Jerusalem that all the exiles should come to Jerusalem. So he calls a meeting again of all the Jewish people back to Jerusalem. They all come to Jerusalem, verse 8. Those who failed to come within three days would, if the leaders and elders so decided, forfeit all their property and be kicked out of the land of Israel. Verse 10, well, then Ezra the priest stood and said to them, you have committed a terrible sin by marrying pagan women. You have increased Israel's guilt and we're headed right down the same path that led us into exile in the first place. Verse 11. So now confess your sin to the Lord, the God of your ancestors, and do what God demands. Separate yourself from the people of the land and from these pagan women. And they divorced these women and sent them and their children back to the pagan nations around them. And there were a few of the Levites who disagreed with that decision, but they were voted down that that's what they should do. I mean, it's, it kind of echoes what we're told in other parts of Scripture where followers of God should not be yoked together with those who are not followers of God. Why? For the sake of our children. Like the first command that God gave Adam and Eve in the garden was to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and then to govern the earth and to care for it. But the first instruction is to, is to our kids. And it's for the sake of your children that God says, I want you to make sure that you marry other followers of God. Why? Because it gives your chance 
your kids the best chance to also become devoted followers of God. So I was a youth pastor for a long time. So I used to tell our teenagers, are you gonna marry somebody you date? I mean, yeah, unless you, it's a mail order bride, right? So if you're gonna marry somebody you date, only date somebody you would marry. And according to the scriptures, both Old and New Testament, we're not to be unequally partnered believers with non-believers. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you should only date other followers of Jesus because you're going to marry somebody you date. So only date somebody you would marry. Another way I would put this is date smart or marry stupid, right? Like this is, yeah. So what does this mean if you married somebody who's, you're already in, a, you're already married. And Paul gives us instruction on this. He said, listen, if you're married to a non-believer and they're willing to stay married to you, don't divorce. Stay married to them because it gives your spouse and your children the best chance to know and to follow Jesus. But if they separate from you because of your faith, it's okay to let them go. It's heartbreaking, but it's okay to let them go. But stay in that relationship if you can, if you're married, so that that spouse and your children have the best chance to know and to follow Jesus. It's like that's, it's, it's just really heavy because our hearts are involved and family is involved and it's, and it's just tough. And then the book of Ezra ends. Like that's it. It names all of the people that married pagan women. It actually, like <laughs> Ezra brings receipts. And he goes, this guy did it, this guy did it, this guy did it, this guy did it. And it's a long, the whole last chapter is just a list of names of people who married outside of their faith and were gonna raise their kids to worship pagan demon gods again. And that's it. Now here's what's cool. Next week, we're gonna tell the story of Nehemiah, which happens, it's basically Ezra part two. So this is the end of the first half of the story of how the children of Israel leave exile and come back to Jerusalem and reestablish themselves as a nation in time for Jesus the Messiah to be born under the Roman Empire, two empires later. But there are three things that I learned from the book of Ezra and the rebuilding of the temple that I wanna share with you before we close our time. The first is this, trust God. Trust that God knows what he's doing. I need to remind myself from this story that I don't have to understand what God is doing to trust that God is doing something. Like they were in, in uh, an exile. The temple had been destroyed in all of Jerusalem. And it looked as though God had abandoned them. But God's looking at our lives and our timeline from a different perspective. And God had already said, I'm going to destroy Jerusalem and the temple because it's been defiled by demon worship. But I'm going to build another one. Well, in their short lifetimes, some of them were born and died after it was built or after it was destroyed and before the next one, but that didn't mean that God didn't know what he was doing. So you might find yourself right now in the middle of a story that God's writing that's much bigger than you. And here in this chapter of your life, everything feels like it's gone to crap. And you might be asking, where is God? But you need this story of Ezra to be reminded that God's writing a bigger story than just the story that you're writing. Or the story that God is writing is much bigger than just the chapter that you and I are in. So what we ought to do in the chapter that our lives occupy, in the bigger book that God is writing across human history, is that I in my chapter will be faithful. I'm going to be an Ezra. I'm going to be a Zerubbabel. I'm going to be Joshua, son of Zahadak, or whatever. Like, I'm, I'm going to be a guy that when God is ready to pull somebody off the bench and put him in the game to score, he's gonna look down the bench and he's gonna see me with my chin strap buttoned. That might not matter, but 
my coach used to say, if you want to play, if I look down and I see your chin strap unbuttoned, I ain't putting you in the game. He says, I want to put guys in the game that are ready to go. Bro, be ready to go. In the meantime, trust God. God wanted the old temple destroyed even if they didn't understand that. And he wanted old things to become new and was determined to rebuild them. And there might be some things in your life, some temples and cities that you built at a time in your life when you weren't following God that he might be trying to tear down so that he can build something new and better in its place. The Apostle Paul talks about the way that God knocks off our rough edges through adversity, develops our faith through hardships, and refines our character through suffering. So if you find yourself in a season of suffering or hardship, bro, chin up. God's doing something. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says, And I am certain of this, that God, who began the good work within you, is going to continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. And if that's how long it takes for God to make you into the person he always intended you to be, that's how long it takes. But God has not stopped working on you. Lean into the season that you're in. Second lesson I learned is this. Play your part. Zerubbabel and Joshua and others saw the opportunity to go back and do something unique in their generation, and they volunteered. Whereas the Levites, a few decades later, Ezra says, didn't want to go. Why? Because they saw themselves as more Persian. And if we're going to be completely honest, it's our pursuit of the American dream. The accumulation of wealth and possessions and status that can dull our senses to the risky steps of faith that God might be calling us to that's going to change the entire direction of our lives and bring us to the purpose for which he gave us our life in the first place. So get ready. <laughs> Play your part. Ask God to give you a moment in time for you to volunteer to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild. Like, be Zerubbabel and Joshua in the time of Cyrus rather than being simply being uh, a Levite in the days of Artaxerxes. Don't be lulled. Remember that while I love living here in this country and I'm grateful to God to be a citizen here, I'm still a stranger here. I'm an exile. This place is not my home. I'm just a uh, passing through. Uh, the old hymn goes, my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue, right? Like my identity, my citizenship is in heaven. So if God called me to lay everything down, to leave Babylon, to leave Persia, to leave the comfort of Boston, I need to be ready to go. I need to be ready to play my part. When God looks at me, I want my chin strap on, and when he says, get in, I wanna run on. I wanna get my shoulder pads dirty. And the third thing, oh, by the way, James chapter two, verse six says this, 17 says this. So you see, faith by itself is not enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Unless your faith is the kind of faith that says, I will actually do what God says, when God says to do it, I don't actually have the kind of faith that saves. And third lesson I learned is this, develop godly character. What spiritual disciplines do you need to develop? What boundaries have you placed in your life to keep you from sin? Because the children of Israel started marrying all the pagan women around them because they had set no spiritual boundaries in their life. They had not made a determination toward any type of spiritual discipline that would keep their hearts clean. And it took a godly influence like Ezra coming back and calling them to faithfulness. So who are the godly influences in your life that are calling you back to faithfulness? I mean, if the only people you follow are the people who do not follow God, I already know where your life is going to end up. So I'll remind you what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, which says this, For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So actually start living as the people of light. Let go of the values, the filters of all of the people around us. 
and let's do something more so that we get something more. Let's make extraordinary choices so that we get extraordinary results. Let's make above average decisions of selflessness and obedience to God to get above average blessings from God. I'm not talking about a prosperity thing. I just don't want to leave anything on the table. I don't want to get to the end of my life and God say, let me show you what I could have done if you'd have just trusted me more. Bro, that's right. I don't want to be the Levites under Artaxerxes. I want to be the Zerubbabel under Cyrus. And I hope you do too. And here's your chance to hit the reset button yourself. Let's pray. God, I love you with all of my heart, and I'm thankful that you love me first. Um, God, there's some of us who are in a tough season. We don't know what you're doing. And uh, we might be tempted to become uh, despondent to make accusations against you as though you don't know what you're doing and that you don't care. I pray that we would change our tune. So if that's where you're at, your prayer is, God, I don't know what you're doing, but I trust what you're doing. And if there's another side of this, then I want you to bring me to the other side. Help me to be faithful in the meantime. Can you make that your prayer? God, let this season of difficulty do in my heart what you intend it to do so that it isn't extended longer than it needs to. I don't want my disobedience to delay your restoration. That genuinely is the prayer of my heart. God, for those of us who have opportunities in front of us that fear is keeping us from, um, God, give us courage. Help us to be willing to button up our chin strap and get our butt in the game. Help us to look for opportunities. Help us to volunteer. Help us to notice the suffering around us, the inequity, the sin, the brokenness, and help us to be a part of the solution. And God, finally, I'm asking you to help us establish healthy boundaries that are gonna keep our hearts from wandering off the path that you've put us on. Keep me personally from sin so that I can stay centered in the middle of your will and plan for my life. I genuinely want everything out of life that you intend for me to get. I want to do everything you intended me to do. I want to hear at the end of my life, well done, good and faithful servant. Dear God, let me be an Ezra. Let me be a Jeshua, let me be as a Rebbebel. In the name of Jesus, I ask this, and we all say it together, amen. You know, the story of Ezra has so many things that we can apply to our lives today, and it's a great reminder that no matter how far you feel like you've drifted away, it's never too late to realign your life with God's plans. So take a second to ask yourself, what area of your life needs some rebuilding? And no matter what it is, know that God is ready to partner with you in that process. And if there is a way that our church can help you, all you have to do is let us know. We'd be happy to pray with you, to connect you to some resources, or to help you find more messages just like this to help you continue learning and knowing more about God so that you can grow in your faith. Another awesome resource that we have right now is our weekly Bible reading plan. Every week, our church together reads specific sections from the Bible that helps us understand the story that God is writing throughout history and leads us right to where we'll be next week. So if you wanna jump in on that, all you need to do is text the word Bible to the number on your screen and we'll help get you set up for that. That's all for this week. We'll see you again next time.